Hi, welcome to Get Up and Go with Canon. Um, it's an honor for me to be here. My name is Johnny Charles. I'm a Toronto-based professional photographer, director, producer, and Canon Canada ambassador. Um, I'm shooting this right now and live streaming using a Canon EOS 90D and a 24 millimeter lens. I'm very grateful to Canon Canada and Canon USA for supplying me with this amazing gear. I'm very grateful to the engineers that developed the EOS webcam utility. I will never go back to a regular webcam ever again. Today I'll be talking to you about cultivating mental well-being through photography and through other tools and attitudes. Um, some of the amazing mental health organizations that I work with include Operation Prefrontal Cortex, which is a mindfulness and meditation organization based in Toronto. We're reducing violence through mindfulness and meditation in the city of Toronto. Calm, the most downloaded meditation and sleep app in the world. Uh, Workman Arts, which is the uh, creative department for the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, Canada's largest mental health organization. Project Healthy Minds, if you're having a very difficult time and need support psychologically, please check out projecthealthyminds.com. That is one of the fastest growing nonprofit mental health organizations in America. And Thrive Global, if you struggle with burnout, please check out thriveglobal.com. Um, this is a platform created by my colleague and mentor, Arianna Huffington, and it's designed to help uh, mitigate and transcend burnout on a global scale. Um, I'm also studying the foundations of applied mindfulness through the University of Toronto. So shout out to the University of Toronto. And as I mentioned before, I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, Canon is a brand that I've been associated with since I was 12 years old. I've been shooting with Canon products since I was a kid. And Canon is probably one of the best companies to talk about uh, cultivating mental well-being through photography as the company came out of the Second World War. This is a company that was designed during one of the most troubling periods in human history. And as a result of the ingenuity, mental resilience and hard work of the Japanese people and the executives involved at Precision Optical Company, which became Canon later on, um, Canon has grown over the past many decades to become one of the preeminent photography and filmmaking brands in the world. I'm very grateful to be a Canon ambassador. This is a dream come true, and I feel very lucky to be speaking to you today as part of National Camera Day. So the inspiration for this workshop is the fact that photography, photography and art has changed my life. Um, I started to view photography as a catalyst for personal development, as a way for me to get to know myself better and to prove myself. Um, I have experienced a lot of anxiety and depression and disillusionment in my career and my life. And photography and some of the other tools that I'll be talking about helped me to get out of some very dark places. Furthermore, many great photographers and other creatives over the course of human history have succumbed to their mental health challenges. And I want to help anyone in the crowd today that may be suffering um, with some of the tools that I'll be uh, sharing with you today. My career has changed profoundly since I started using photography as a tool for the cultivation of mental well-being or mental health. Um, I have better clients today. There's less ambiguity in my goals. I make more money than before. My colleagues are amazing in comparison to the colleagues I had 10 or 15 years ago. I have better boundaries. I have more grit and patience. I have greater self-awareness and I have an inner locus of control. I'm less predisposed to focusing on what other people may want me to do or what other people may need from me. Um, I want to acknowledge the, the challenges of the last 15 or 16 months. Um, the pandemic, what a curveball, what a challenging period. Please let me know in the poll that's about to come up if the pandemic increased the prevalence and or intensity of stress in your life. So mental health during the pandemic, uh, anxiety and depression, the rates of both were increasing exponentially before the pandemic 
and things simply got worse as the pandemic continued to play out. Furthermore, in certain parts of the world, like Japan, suicidality increased as a result of the pandemic. So it was a very challenging period. Uh, for me, I have a very robust support system. I work with many mental health professionals. Um, I work on myself on a daily basis. And yet the dark, cold winter months in Toronto during the pandemic were very difficult for me. I had some very dark moments. And thankfully, photography and working with Canon helped me a great deal. Um, I've been shooting a series on the COVID pandemic known as the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is based on how it's played out in Toronto. And simply engaging in this personal project and other personal projects had a profoundly positive effect on my mental well-being, um, especially during the cold winter months. The photographer's role in society. Um, some of you may downplay the significance of what you do as a photographer or as a creative, but I want to tell you today that a photographer's role in society is a significant one. A, significant one. a creative's role in society is a significant one. As human beings, we construct our sense of selves um, through photographs, through images, through relationships, through the environments that we're in, and through our uh, through our activities. And the ego is constructed, especially through social media, based on images of ourselves, images of other people, images that we like, and also images that we dislike. Photographers and other creatives are also avatars for self-actualization. They show others, or rather we show others, that it's possible to create, it's possible to uh, manifest a dream, it's possible to set a, a, an audacious goal and go for it. Also, we're in touch with our inherent creativity. All human beings are inherently creative, but most human beings don't know that. So simply based on our example, people are given permission to create in the ways that they feel most comfortable creating. We also bring joy to others. What would a global pandemic be without beautiful pictures, great movies, and other forms of art. So regardless of how modest or small your project may be, please know that it's significant and you matter and what you do matters a lot. The butterfly effect, um, this is a concept from quantum physics and philosophy. And it's the idea that small things can have nonlinear impacts on complex systems. So butterfly flapping its wings in central China it may lead to the demolition of a building in New York City. Again, what you do matters, even though you may not be able to see the impact of it on a wide scale. You are important and what you do as a photographer and as a creative matters a lot. Every artist has a central story to tell. The difficulty, the impossible task is trying to present that story in pictures. Gregory Crudson. So the challenge that I have ahead of me today is to tell you my life story, how photography saved my life, and how photography and other forms of art helped me to cultivate mental well-being. Um, these are my wonderful parents. My parents are my best friends. Um, they're my greatest source of in inspiration and my greatest supporters. So I dedicate this presentation to them and also to Canon Canada and Canon USA. Um, I was born in Laval, Quebec, which is just outside of Montreal, Quebec. Both my parents are Haitian, we're from Haiti. And I had a very idyllic childhood. And at around the age of four, my parents decided to move back to Haiti. And it was a very chaotic period in our lives. And after about a year and a half, we realized that the volatility of the Haitian government and other facets of Haiti made living in Haiti unsafe for us. So we ended up moving to Toronto, Canada, where I'm now located. Um, my parents knew that I had a propensity for visual arts. They knew that I love visual arts and that I was seemingly good at it. So they had me audition um, around the age of eight, I believe, for the Claude Watson School for the Arts. The Claude Watson School for the Arts is like Toronto's equivalent to Juilliard. It's a specialized art school many children audition for it every year and 60 get in. So I got in and I loved it. I was immersed in the arts, uh, singing, dancing, drawing, etc. And it was a great time. However, I started to experience anxiety and depression at that time. These are my earliest memories of anxiety and depression. 
And what triggered it was unprocessed childhood trauma, my genetics, and also the fact that I missed my friends from my original elementary school. Um, so I missed them very greatly to the point that my parents had me move back to my old school. So I quit this amazing art school that I had been in for a year and moved back to uh, a, the, the so-called regular school system. Um, by the seventh grade, when I was in middle school, I was no longer in a specialized arts program, but I still loved the arts. And my father saw that I was growing fond of photography in particular. And he wanted me to learn film photography and I was interested as well. So he had me sign up for the Toronto School of Art. And uh, I'm very privileged to have had access to the EOS 5 at the age of 12. Uh, my father rented it for me so that I could learn how to shoot and develop film um, with adults at the age of 12 at the Toronto School of Art. Um, this is one of my earliest photographs that I shot at the age of 12. Um, the, the term for these individuals at the time was squeegee kids. Um, so squeegee kids would, you know, wash vehicles that would pass by to, to get change. Um, at a technical level, this picture is not very good, but it, it definitely solidified my love of photography. I love the whole process, walking around the streets of Toronto, shooting people, shooting buildings, going back and developing the film. Um, it was very therapeutic. And these are some of my earliest memories of experiencing mindfulness, although I didn't have a word for it at the time. Um, this is uh, my family's cat, Hercules, one of my best friends. Uh, this is, one, again, one of my earliest photographs, which I shot at around the age of 12, using the EOS 5, by the way. Um, by the eighth grade, I realized that quitting the Claude Watson arts program was a big mistake. So I, I re-auditioned for the program for a second time. And uh, I believe that I believe that there was um, I believe that this was the first time that a Claude Watson student had auditioned twice. Now it's quite normal, but I was the the first student, as far as I can tell, who auditioned for the program twice and got in. And there was an amazing photography studio at our high school, at Earl Heck Secondary School, which is the school that housed the Claude Watson Arts Program at the high school level. And that was, that was my sanctuary. Um, also, my father had moved away. He moved overseas to teach um, English, African studies, and, and other subjects um, in the United States and in other countries. So that was, that was somewhat traumatic for me at the time because I went from being in a two-parent household to being in a single-parent household. And I found myself gravitating towards photography and other uh, coping mechanisms like perfectionism in my studies and in sports um, to cope with missing my father and also the overprotective nature of my mother. At the time, my aunt saw that my love for photography had grown. So she bought me the EOS Elan 2, which is also known as the EOS 55. And this became by far one of my favorite uh, cameras, um, which I used well into my, my mid 20s. Um, going back to what I mentioned in regards to the, some of the trauma that I experienced as a kid, there's a difference between big T traumas and small T traumas. And this is very important for photographers and all people to understand. Uh, big T traumas are things like uh, acts of extreme violence, um, sexual assault, uh, extreme car accidents. But small T traumas are things like feeling abandoned, um, my mom was so busy when I was, uh, when I was younger as a psychiatric nurse and sometimes she would forget to pick me up from school or she would pick me up last, uh, in comparison to all the other kids. So that's an example of small T trauma and coming to term with small T trauma and big T trauma is very important. Um, as these traumas can lead photographers and creatives to make many poor decisions, especially at the, pro uh, the professional level. The way that small T and big T trauma manifest um, in the brain is that the prefrontal cortex, which is the executive functioning part of the brain, it ends up shrinking. So your ability to make rational decisions becomes compromised, 
whereas the amygdala, the fight, flight, freeze part of the brain becomes much larger, much more dominant. That's why people that have many unprocessed traumas tend to snap, tend to uh, jump to conclusions that may be inaccurate. So my amygdala for most of my life, for most of my career was running the show. And I was driven by fears, insecurities, and stress uh, for the vast majority of my life and for the vast majority of my career. Shame and guilt. Um, the traumas that I uh, experienced, they led to chronic shame and guilt. And many people don't know what the difference between shame and guilt are. Shame is about who you are. So it's who you are inherently as a person is bad, is what chronic shame would lead you to think. Guilt suggests that what you did is bad. And both, if they're experienced on a daily basis at a high volume, can lead to a lot of poor decision making, a lot of stress. And for the vast majority of my life, the vast majority of my career, again, I was driven by shame and guilt. Shame and guilt chronically uh, lead to what's called a fixed mindset. And I love this quote by Carol Dweck. In the fixed mindset, everything is about the outcome. If you fail or if you're not the best, it's all being wasted. The growth mindset allows people to value what they're doing regardless of the outcome. So if one uses photography as a tool for the cultivation of mental well-being, if one uses other tools for the cultivation of mental well-being, what happens is you develop what's called a growth mindset. You see possibilities where there were none before. You're not stifled by setbacks, but with the fixed mindset, everything has to be a certain way. There's only one or two ways of doing things. And if things don't go exactly as you plan, it's a failure. So I spent the vast majority of my, my, my life in a fixed mindset, and it really stifled me creatively and as a professional. Interdependency, codependency, and counterdependency. This is hugely important, especially for those of you that are entrepreneurs and running businesses. Codependency is very common. Codependency is idealizing and placing an excessive amount of importance on the opinions of others, the lives of others, substances, certain processes. It's possible to create a codependent relationship with photography or any other form of art. So when I was highly codependent and I identified as, and I over identified as a photographer, it was the be all and end all of who I was. And if I got poor feedback about my photography, it was as if someone was act, attacking me personally. Um, Counter-dependency is shame-based, just like codependency, except that unlike codependency, which involves too much closeness, too much intimacy, counter-dependency is too much distance, a lack of intimacy. So both codependency and counter-dependency are disastrous for photographers and other creatives. The, the healthy alternative, which transcends this duality of codependency and counterdependency is what's called interdependency. So codependency and counterdependency are based on fears, insecurities, shame, guilt, unprocessed traumas. Interdependency is above all that. So I believe that it's very important that photographers and other creatives gr gravitate towards interdependency by engaging in practices like mindfulness, um, journaling, and working with mental health professionals. Also, one of my therapists, whose name is Darlene Lancer, she's an expert on codependency, and I encourage you to look up her book, Conquering Shame and Codependency. So this is uh, one of the photographs that I shot in high school in the ninth grade, um, part of a personal project that I was just shooting in downtown Toronto's Chinatown. And I love, I love photographing downtown and other parts of Toronto, but as I mentioned before, in the background, when I wasn't shooting, I was experiencing all of these fears and insecurities that really bogged me down, and in retrospect, made my creative possibilities uh, quite limited. I also ended up going to Europe um, with the Claude Watson uh, Arts Program. We went to France and Italy, and shooting on the, with the Canon Yaw Salon too, um, I was able to expand my skill sets overseas, uh, my technical skill sets overseas um, at a very early age. Uh, this is my good friend, Dave. I shot this when we were in Cancun, Mexico, uh, towards the end of high school. Uh, we're still good friends to this day. And um, I'm very grateful for uh, my old friends and my support system 
for helping me get through very challenging periods in my life, um, especially the, the pandemic. When we fail to set boundaries and hold people accountable, we feel used and mistreated. This is why we sometimes attack who they are, which is far more hurtful than addressing a behavior or a choice. So when I was oblivious to my pain and trauma, when I was highly codependent, when I was driven by shame, guilt, anxiety, and regret, I lacked in boundaries. I didn't know where I ended and other people started. My likes and dislikes were vague. My standards for myself were very vague. And because I engaged in a lot of workaholism and perfectionism, I failed to set boundaries with myself. I worked nonstop in high school. I was an overachiever. I was on student council. I was the arts council president. I was on the track team. I was on the rugby team. Um, I would be at school from 7 a.m. Uh, for basketball practice until 7 p.m. I was in countless clubs and all of that, although it seemed great on the surface, was me coping uh, in a maladaptive way, uh, a cry for help, so to speak. So boundaries are hugely important. I only started learning about boundaries about seven years ago. And a boundary is a limit of a subject or sphere of activity. It defines what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with, what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do, what you're willing to say yes to and what you're not willing to say yes to. Your no's are very important. There's an amazing book on boundaries called The Power of No by James Altucher, and I strongly recommend that all photographers and all creatives uh, check out that book. Uh, personality traits. Uh, when I lacked in self-awareness and when I was oblivious to the nature of the human psyche, I was not, I, I lacked the vocabulary to define my personality and how it would play out in my artistic practices, my photography practices. And the big five personality traits are extroversion, agreeableness, openness, conscientiousness, and neuroticism. And you can find out um, what personality traits are most dominant in your own psyche by taking the Myers-Briggs um, type indicator test or any other personality trait test. They'll at least give you some sort of indication of how you're wired. And this can be very beneficial, especially if you're a creative that runs a business and you're interacting with other people. Um, some of the personality traits that are most important to creatives, to photographers, are extroversion, agreeableness, openness, and conscientiousness. However, these personality traits can be taken to an extreme. For example, in business, if you're too agreeable, um, it, can act, it can put you at a disadvantage. You're essentially too nice and you're lacking in boundaries. So take these personality traits as a, as a, with a grain of salt and realize that you can cultivate them if you're deficient in any one of them, but be very careful because too much of any one personality trait can be disastrous to your creative process as a photographer and to your business. Um, neuroticism uh, creates a lot of problem. And I was very neurotic for the vast majority of my life due to the unprocessed traumas that I mentioned before. In any case, by the time high school had ended, I had an existential crisis. I had gone into numerous schools, numerous universities in the United States and Canada for photography, but I was not sure if photography was a path for me. I was not sure if it was possible for one to generate an income and make a living as a photographer, as a creative. So I ended up going to the University of Western Ontario um, to study philosophy. Number one, because I believe that philosophy could help me solidify or identify my career path. And number two, Western was and still is considered the number one party school um, in Canada, so I wanted to uh, get out of my, my parents' house and experience some semblance of freedom. However, I was so exhausted from all of the workaholism and perfectionism that I perpetuated in high school as a coping mechanism that I was not very studious as a university student. I spent a lot of my time partying and, and self-medicating, self-loathing, shame, anxiety, guilt, regret. And I took, I took a lot of time off from photography. Uh, this image here shows me, uh, and you can tell it's from the early 2000s since I have a gigantic uh, white t-shirt on. Uh, this is me shooting um, a, a fashion series for a, for a startup. 
um, shooting their editorials and their lookbook. And I was very depressed at this time, um, possibly, or at least in part because I took so much time off of photography um, because my relationship with my father was virtually non-existent at this point, and because I lacked in introspection, in mindfulness, in self-awareness. Um, I was partying all the time, not going to class very much, and not creating art. So it created the perfect conditions for nihilism and self-destruction. Um, regardless, I was still able to create some artwork um, that I was proud of during university, but my volume of engagement in the arts was very minimal at that time. And I was um, in many, many dangerous situations, especially um, in regards to binge drinking. Life is full of challenges. We all have them. Art has helped me through my own deep valleys. So this quote is by Sarah Gio. And towards the end of university in my last semester specifically, I realized how important art was in my life I realized that I needed to make a decision in regards to my career path. What was I going to do, become a professional philosopher? After putting some thought into it, following a pretty painful week-long period of depression, I came to the conclusion that pursuing the path of, of a professional photographer was the wisest decision that I could make. And studying existentialism, um, philosophers like Nietzsche um, towards the end of university helped me to come to that conclusion. So I made the decision in my final semester to become a professional photographer. And at that time, um, my father again had helped me purchase a, uh, an EOS 20D. And this is, the, this is the SLR that I've used the most in my life. I, I've used this SLR to the point that it fell apart in my hands because I was shooting with it at such a high volume early on in my career and also pushing it to its max by um, shooting in mosh pits and in uh, very physically volatile venues. Um, towards the end of university, I worked with a DJ called DJ Tricks. He was one of the most popular DJs in London, Ontario at the time. This is one of the shots that I, I, I took of him and we did a number of photo shoots and he loved them. And this was my proof of concept. Seeing him, seeing how happy he was with the end product seeing how happy he was with the process of working with me, even though this image isn't particularly strong, uh, that's all the permission that I needed to move forward. And I was, I was willing and able at that time to take the steps needed to, to begin the, the infancy of my career. We're making photographs to understand what our lives mean to us. So prior to making the decision of becoming a professional photographer, my life lacked in meaning. Um, I was a, on a very dangerous course um, at the University of Western Ontario. Um, many of my habits were dangerous. The people that I associated with were psychologically a good match for me. I was highly codependent, insecure, shame-based, and so were all of my friends. So once photography re-entered my life, I was reignited, my life had meaning, and I was not engaged in nearly as much nihilism as before. The danger of adventure is worth a thousand days of ease and comfort. So once I made the decision to become a professional photographer, once I defined myself in that way as a creative, um, the adventure began. I've been on an adventure for 15 years now, and it's incredible um, where my cameras have taken me, where my love and passion for photography have taken me. Um, I've been all over the world. I've worked with some of um, my favorite artists, entertainers and entrepreneurs. And I'm so grateful that I decided to go on this adventure um, during a time that was very uh, challenging for me psychologically. Early on in my career, um, I did a photo shoot with MLP, one of my favorite rap groups. And this was the moment when I realized that I could bridge the gap between those I admire from afar, watching them on TV, listening to them via an iPod, and I could bridge that gap and work with the people that I admired the most. So photography, um, as far as cultivating mental well-being, um, it can help you connect ideas and connect with people in ways that were seemingly impossible before if you remain open-minded, if you cultivate the openness that I mentioned earlier. However, 
early on in my career and for many, many moments following the early stages of my career, I felt like an imposter. The beauty of the imposter syndrome is you vacillate. The beauty of the imposter syndrome is that you vacillate between extreme egomania and a complete feeling of, I'm a fraud. Oh God, they're on to me. Sorry about that. You vacillate between egomania and a complete feeling of, I'm a fraud. Oh God, they're on to me. I'm a fraud. Just try to ride the egomania mania when it comes and enjoy it and then slide through the idea of fraud. So because I wasn't able to monetize my career early on, because I had a lot of these fears and insecurities working in the background, I felt inadequate most of the time. And the imposter syndrome, as the name suggests, is feeling as if you're an imposter, feeling as if your colleagues, your friends, your family are going to find out that you're a fraud, that you're photography practice, your artistic practice, your aspirations, they're, um, uh, they're, they're illusory, they're unrealistic, and you're not actually committed to the path that you're on. The imposter syndrome, um, without addressing it, without processing it, without looking at it with support, it can lead to different forms of self-sabotage, producing work that is below your standards, um, working with people that may be below your standards. Um, sabotaging projects or underpricing yourself if you're a, a, an entrepreneur. And um, the, the solution to the imposter syndrome is constantly reminding yourself of what you're capable of and what you've done in the past. So I have written reminders through Google Keep and in my journals reminding me of my accomplishments. Oh yeah, Drake told me I was great. Director X said that I was great. Ariana Huffington said that I'm awesome. I've helped many Fortune 500 companies. I've helped startups. I've helped many young people with mental health issues. So I'm constantly reminding myself on a daily basis of my past accomplishments, not to bolster my ego or to build myself up in an insecure way, but to challenge the messages of shame and insecurity that codependency and the imposter syndrome perpetuate. This is one of my portraits of Gene Simmons, uh, one of the most well-known rock stars um, alive today. And although I love this portrait, um, I remember beating myself up about the shoot. Um, it didn't go quote unquote perfectly. And I had the imposter syndrome running in the background, which also undermined the enjoyment that I could have experienced while engaged in the shoot, while shooting someone that I uh, admire. Cognitive, cognitive biases, um, these can potentially get in the way of your creative process and your career as a photographer. And they can also get in the way of simply creating new projects and having fun. Cognitive, cognitive biases are adaptive to a certain degree because they're mental shortcuts. They allow the brain to save energy. But if you're unaware of them, if you don't know that you have certain cognitive, cognitive biases at work, they can work against you. So the halo effect um, is a well-known cognitive, bi cognitive bias, and it leads us to take one accomplishment or one area of mastery that someone embodies and to assume that they're proficient in many other areas of their lives, which is um, not true in many cases. The availability bias, this is prioritizing information that's readily available, even if it may be inaccurate. The Dunning-Kruger effect, I've cause myself to suffer greatly because of the Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect leads one to believe that one is more proficient, more um, experienced than one actually is. So I thought that I would reach my vague definitions of success within two years. I thought that it would only take two years to reach my vague definitions of success once I made the decision to become a professional photographer, even though I lack the professionalism the relationships, um, and many other qualities that would lead me to success. The hard easy effect has led me to procrastinate a lot. So the hard easy effect is basically exaggerating how difficult it, uh, a seemingly hard task is and how easy, I mean, how hard a seemingly easy task is. And confirmation bias will also, uh, can potentially also lead you to, uh, sabotage yourself as a photographer and as a creative and to 
minimize your potential. The confirmation bias leads you to consume information and to surround yourself with people that reinforce your beliefs. And this can be good unless your beliefs are maladaptive and not conducive to helping you reach your goals. So this is one of my portraits of Nas, my favorite rapper, and he's holding one of my portraits of himself. And this was my first time spending any significant amount of time with Nas. And the halo effect was so strong for me in this moment. I was completely starstruck and I failed to ask Nas uh, very important questions about his career that may have benefited me. Um, questions about his life that may have benefited me because I was so fixated on Nas the superstar. I didn't see him as a human being until later in the conversation. So please be mindful of the halo effect and realize that human beings are just human beings. Just because someone is great at one or two things doesn't necessarily mean that they have their life in order in other areas. So Jim Lauer and Tony Schwartz, they came up with the theory of full engagement. So the more insecure and shame-based I was, the more terrible I was at managing my energy. And according to the theory of full engagement, managing energy is far more important than managing time. Um, energizing ourselves in the different areas of our life is hugely important. And if, if we neglect any one area of our life, it's going to carry over into our photography practice, into our artistic practice. Um, hypothetically, you can do what I did, which is go all in on your creative path, put all of your time and energy into your artwork, into your photography. But if you're neglecting your relationships, if you're neglecting your physical well-being, your psychological well-being, if you're not engaged in your community, if you're not taking enough breaks, then you're going to be limited to what you can create as a photographer and as a creative. So managing energy is hugely important. Um, as you can see here, full engagement requires spiritual alignment, mental focus, emotional connection, and physical energy. So if you want to succeed as, as a photographer, if you want to succeed as a creative, make sure you do not neglect any other aspects of your life. Um, make sure to cultivate energy in all the aspects of your life that are important to you. The minimal effective dose. So again, when I was far more insecure than I am today, I was very poor at managing my energy. So I would go past the point of effectiveness in many areas. I would shoot far too much. I would engage in the sales process far too much and I would neglect many other aspects of my life. And after a certain point, um, you, start, you start experiencing diminishing returns. You reach a point whereby more effort isn't doing anything for you. It's not yielding the desired results. What I find, however, um, most photographers, most creatives aren't nearly as neurotic as I can be. So most people don't get to the point of maximum yield or the point of no return. So I find that most people need to practice more, shoot more, engage in the different facets of their business more than they usually do. However, once you go past that point of effectiveness, once you go past the minimal effective dose, you can, you're, you're opening yourself up to chronic stress and burnout. And I've experienced countless burnouts over the course of my life. And the, the, on the back end of burning out is anxiety, migraines, headaches, depression, weight gain, potential heart disease, sleep problems, digestive problems. I've experienced many of these things and they can completely undermine your creativity, your relationships and your overall well-being. Um, I shot this image of TI in 2014. And at that point I had, a, I was experiencing another ex existential crisis. I was managing more than 40 contractors through my production company my coping mechanisms of perfectionism and workaholism had reached a critical point and my life was just a disaster. I was fully present and locked in during this project, but outside of uh, shooting certain projects, I was completely unsatisfied, very unhappy, very depressed, very anxious. And so in 2014, I made the decision to quit drinking alcohol. I made the decision to end many of my most codependent relationships and I started to turn my life around. I started um, engaging in psychotherapy to a greater degree than before. before. 
I joined different spiritual groups and support groups. I started reading numerous psychology texts, philosophy texts, spiritual texts, and I started reverse engineering my consciousness, my psyche, to understand how I got to a point, to understand how I had put myself in so many dangerous situations. And my life has uh, steadily improved since. Um, when I was at my most insecure, I lacked an in emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is managing emotions, understanding emotions, facilitating, facilitating emotion and thought and perceiving and expressing emotion. And this, this means that you can understand your own emotions and how they play out, and that you can also understand the emotions of others. IQ is intellect. Knowing how to shoot a project and the technical aspects of it is great. But what's more valuable as, as a professional photographer, as a creative, and in the business world is EQ. Um, emotional intelligence is the ultimate skill and cultivating mental well-being, engaging in mindfulness practices, et cetera, lead to the cultivation of emotional intelligence. Whereas your IQ, your intellect is more or less fixed. You can't really improve it all that much. And as I mentioned, there's numerous benefits to cultivating emotional intelligence. You'll make more money. Your work relationships, whether you're professional, creative or not, will improve. Um, you'll get more opportunities and promotions. And hiring managers, as I mentioned before, value EQ more so than IQ. Um, there are many barriers to cultivating mental health, mental well-being as a photographer, as a creative, chronic stress and burnout, not approaching your photography practice, your, your creative practices from a position of mindfulness, from a position of reverence and attention, unprocessed trauma, um, a lack of introspective and mindfulness-based practices like meditation, having unmet needs is very problematic to the cultivation of mental well-being. If your goals are poorly defined, if your standards are poorly defined, this can create many problems for photographers and other creatives. And of course, untreated mental illnesses and addictions will get in the way. When I was engaged in binge drinking um, every weekend prior to uh, quitting alcohol seven years ago, it created many problems for me and put me in many dangerous situations. So if you struggle with any substance abuse issues, uh, please get help. Again, Project Healthy Minds is a great resource, projecthealthyminds.com. Also, be very mindful of who you interact with, who you do business with, your friends, certain family members. Be cognizant of the people in your life that uh, inspire you, that support your creative path, and that help you to cultivate your mental well-being. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, this is a, a theory that defines the motivations and the needs of all human beings. And in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if the lower needs are not met, then it's not possible to uh, attain self-actualization in any sustainable way. So self-actualization is the creation of your photography, of your art, um, of a startup, of your business. So if your most basic ne needs are not met, it's not possible to achieve self-actualization in any sustainable way. You can see how self-actualization um, plays out here and how it, the foundation of self-actualization uh, lies in physiological needs, safety needs, belongingness, esteem needs. A good acronym to remember is HALT. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired, HALT. This will remind you to get your most basic needs met and to not shoot or engage in any other projects until your most basic needs are met. So I shot this um, photograph of Drake. This is Drake's first sold out, uh, first sold out concert in Toronto. Um, I was fully locked in. I was fully present when I shot this image. I knew it was a special moment. To me, this is the moment when Drake made it. And it was so inspiring to me because I could see that he self-actualized. I, I could see that he had reached the beginning of his full potential. And after I got all the images that I was hired to shoot for this particular assignment, I reminded myself that if Drake can make it, I can make it too. I can reach my definition of self-actualization. So again, it's very important to at least be in close proximity to people that are self-actualized or on the path of self-actualization to remind yourself of what's possible for you as a photographer, as a creative. Um, going back to past traumas, past traumas exist 
in the realm of the unconscious mind or what Carl Jung calls the shadow. Sigmund Freud called it the unconscious mind. So most of our motivations, most of our knee-jerk reactions exist in the realm of the unconscious. Most of our, most of our day-to-day decisions are below the threshold of our consciousness. And it's not possible to truly come to terms with our past traumas, our fears, our insecurities, and also the beneficial parts of our consciousness if we're not engaged in practices that cultivate our mental well-being, if we're not engaged in mindfulness-based practices, which I'll be talking about in my next workshop. Um, as I mentioned earlier, over-identifying as a photographer created many problems in my life, um, made me very sensitive to feedback, um, neg seemingly negative feedback, and I took many things personally. Also, a lot of my motivations, as I mentioned before, were codependent. So I was driven a lot in my, in my early years as a photographer by resentment, by anger. I wanted to prove people wrong because they had attacked my ego identity as a photographer, as a human being. I needed to show them um, that they were wrong and I was right. If you have any codependent motivations like this, it's very important that you do the work to untangle them because these are not intrinsic motivations. These are motivations that depend on other people and what they think of you. Psychological integration is what Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud would define as coming to terms with your shadow, coming to terms with your unconscious mind, bringing the aspects of yourself that aren't in conscious awareness to the realm of the conscious. And uh, meditation and journaling and psychotherapy are some of the most effective tools to do this. It is possible to become self-actualized, to reach the pinnacle of your creativity, but lack in psychological integration. And when that happens, you see um, things like drug overdoses. Many well-known artists have passed away due to drug overdoses, even though they reached the pinnacle of their creative paths. It's because they lacked in psychological integration. They did not come to terms with their fears and insecurities. So lacking in psychological integration can take everything away from you. You can reach the peak of the photography world. You can reach the peak of the filmmaking world. But if you're not working towards psychological integration, you can lose it all overnight in a few hours, in a few days, in a few months. Um, please let me know through the poll that's going to come up if you are fully present and totally engaged when you are photographing or filmmaking. Um, I lacked in mindfulness a lot uh, beforehand, but it would be great to hear from all of you to, to know if you're fully engaged um, when, you're, when you're shooting, when you're working. Now, mindfulness is probably the most valuable tool um, that I've used in my day-to-day -day life and in my path as a photographer. Uh, I meditate every day. I meditated before this event. I meditate before all of my uh, seemingly important shoots. And I also meditate afterwards to calm my mind down. Um, this is a photograph of Julian Christian Lutz, uh, professionally known as Director X. He's the co-founder of Operation Prefrontal Cortex. I'm our organization's art director. and. His life has improved and his career has improved tremendously. He was already at the top of his game as Canada's most successful music video director. And I've seen him improve even further through a daily mindfulness practice. And since our organization has inspired and taught meditation to thousands of young people around the world, I've seen the effects on youth. So I believe that mindfulness practices and different forms of meditation are the closest thing that modern science has to a magic bullet in terms of the cultivation of mental health and engaging in these practices will help you get in the zone as a photographer, as a creative, and will also help you connect the dots in relation to many different ideas that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. Mindfulness is non-judgmental awareness of the present moment. And the benefits of mindfulness, as I, I mentioned, are, are many fold. Uh, you'll reduce anxiety you'll reduce depression, um, you'll be more aware, you'll have the ability to focus for extended periods of time. And since business is by nature competitive, it's very difficult to compete with um, 
your colleagues who can regulate their emotions and can show up fully present, not only fully present for creative projects and while on set, but also fully present in other areas of their life and in business meetings, et cetera. Uh, the benefits of mindfulness are tremendous. And I strongly recommend, recommend mindfulness practices for all photographers, all creatives. A flow state, a flow state is mindfulness in action. It's being in the zone. It's a mental state that involves a sufficient level of difficulty so that you're fully engaged, but not so much difficulty that you're self-conscious. And also the level of difficulty doesn't uh, result in boredom. So flow states, getting in the zone, being on a set, and not thinking about the person that honked at you in traffic, not being worried about your doctor's appointment three days from now, simply focusing on your subject, focusing on the sensation of the camera in your hand, your breathing, and what you, you've set out to do. Um, this is one of my portraits of a Canadian dancer named Claudia Marjanovic. She worked with Cirque du Soleil. Um, and during this, during this shoot, I was fully present. I was fully engaged. I was fully locked into her and we were able to create some great images um, during this personal project. As I mentioned, uh, meditation has opened so many doors for me. I've been able to connect so many dots, create new ventures, uh, connect with people that were unreachable before simply because I got to know myself better, simply because I became more effective at regulating my emotions. So again, mindfulness, I, I cannot I cannot overemphasize the benefits of mindfulness. And I really look forward to talking to you all about mindfulness in my workshop on it um, later today. So there's different types of mindfulness practices. Mindful eating, this is paying close attention to the sensation of the food on your spoon, how it feels and tastes in your mouth, um, the thoughts that are permeating, permeating in your consciousness while you're eating, walking meditation, mindful photography, which I previously described, Mindfulness meditation, which is simply focusing on, focusing on your breath or focusing on a specific object. Mantra meditation. And visualization meditation is very powerful. I use mood boards for all my projects, so I review them um, and then meditate on them before going into a shoot. I also have a vision board that shows me images of how I want my life to play out and the life that I've envisioned for myself. So I review my vision board on a weekly basis, sometimes up to five times a week, and then I meditate on how it, it will feel to live the life that I want to live, how, how it will feel to create the projects that I want to create. Um, please let me know in the, in the poll, is your relationship to social media healthy? I believe that many people around the world um, have unhealthy relationships to social media. I'm one of them. Early on in my career, given how codependent I was, I was always keeping tabs on other photographers, comparing myself to other photographers, um, comparing my accomplishments or lack thereof to other photographers and other creatives as I start to develop new skill sets and expand in other areas. And I can tell you that comparison ruins joy. Comparison is not mindfulness. We're all unique. We're all different. We're, it, comparing yourself to someone else is like comparing an apple to an orange. So if you have to do market research as part of your business, please try to limit that to a couple of times for a couple of hours per month. And if you have to use um, social media on a day-to-day -day basis, please try to limit it as overuse of social media can lead to, ang can lead to anxiety and depression. Um, the science on this is relatively clear at this point. So I tend to limit my social media use to about two hours per day if I'm not working. I use timers. Um, I block time for mindless social media use. Um, I practice mindfulness so that I'm not attached to my knee-jerk reactions when I see something on social media that I don't like, or if I see a photographer doing something that I aspire to do. Also, unfollow and mute the accounts that may trigger you, but don't unfollow and mute too many because you don't want to get into confirmation bias too much. It is good to follow at least a couple of people that you disagree with to remind yourself of contrary ways of thinking, contrary ways of viewing the world. And this will have a positive effect on your mental health and on your creativity as a photographer and as a creative. Words can inspire and words can destroy. Choose yours well. 
also, in addition to paying attention to how you use social media and how you're showing up during your photography projects, be very mindful of the words you use to describe yourself, the words you use to describe others, the words you just use to describe your artwork, because words are very powerful. Thoughts become things, words become things. So be very aware of the words that you use. Are the words that you're using empowering and useful or are they disempowering and useless? Um, nature photography is very powerful. Um, there's a lot of research on the benefits of being in nature. If you're not a nature photographer, I strongly implore you to get out in nature, especially during the summer, go for a shoot, hike for a couple of hours and just shoot. This is very therapeutic and will improve your mental well-being, whether you're a nature photographer or not. This is one of my shots of Joe Zyko National Park in central China, and this was one of the most peaceful moments during a relatively stressful trip. Uh, mental health through portrait photography. Other people are mirrors into our own consciousness. You can learn about yourself by engaging in other people. The thoughts and knee-jerk reactions that come up when you're engaging with someone else tell you about yourself and tell you about uh, your photography practice. So talk to your portrait photography subjects, engage in portrait photography whenever you have a chance. <clears throat> in central China, this gentleman posed for me like this simply because I had a 15 minute conversation with him beforehand and bought one of his pipes. His guard was down, he trusted me. So when, it, when I asked him to, to take a picture, he brought out the big pipe and this is now by far one of my favorite portraits. I show this to all of my clients and potential clients. Travel photography, the chaos of travel, teaches us that things can go wrong. Things don't go as planned. All types of things have happened to me during my travels. I've been in numerous dangerous situations and travel photography is an opportunity to practice mindfulness, presence, understanding that things don't always go according to plan. This is especially important for entrepreneurs to know. And uh, this is an image that I shot in the Zikrit Desert in Qatar. Um, I was producing a graphic design project. Altruistic photography, the mental health benefits of giving back, contributing to nonprofit projects. I would not be speaking, speaking to you today without all of the nonprofit work that I've done in the past. Um, Volunteering, engaging in nonprofit activities improves mental well being. This is a scientifically proven fact. So give back to your community. It will take you out of your own egoism and, put, and will allow you to be of service to others. Very important. Um, I shot this on behalf of Operation Prefrontal Cortex. Um, this was from an event as, at Design Exchange where we inspired and taught hundreds of young people how to meditate. Do you consider photography or filmmaking a form of self-care or therapy? Please let me know in the poll that is gonna be coming up. Um, as you can see here, I'm incredibly happy. This was at around the time of my existential crisis in 2014. And you can see the sheer joy that shooting a project that I love uh, brought to me. It's uh, quite apparent that photography uh, can be a form of self-care and therapy from my perspective. You're the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. Again, please be very careful of who you spend time with, especially if you're an entrepreneur, it matters. If you have friends who are engaged in habits or beliefs that are maladaptive and that are not conducive to your goals, please limit your exposure to them. You don't have to cut them off, but please be cognizant of who you spend time with. This is Jamel Shabazz, one of my mentors, one of the most prolific photographers in America and a good example of the type of people that I associate myself with and that have helped me um, reach the heights of creativity that I've experienced by my standards. Journaling is a practice that has completely transformed my life. The best photographers, the best creatives are prolific writers and they solidify their thoughts through writing via journals and other forms of writing. So I strongly recommend that all photographers, all creatives keep at least one journal. My gratitude journal has gone me through some very tough times. Every day I write down three things that I'm grateful for and why I'm grateful for them. CBT, I would not be here today. I would not have been able to work with Canon or even engage in the negotiation process when Canon 
um, reached out to me without CBT. Also, I was trying to work with Canon between 2008 up until last year. And without CBT and mindfulness practices, I would have not had the grit or endurance to keep calling and emailing Canon. And, and now we're doing business and I'm very, very grateful to be here. Uh, the R6 shooting my project on the COVID-19 pandemic definitely got me through a very tough time this past winter. So I wanna remind you, if you have personal projects that you want to create, if you have personal projects on the go, please don't procrastinate, get on them. They will help your mental well-being. Um, I'm just gonna wrap up here since I only have a minute. Uh, cultivating mental health as a photographer in, involves getting your needs met, setting aside time for your projects, aiming low. Don't try to meditate for 20 minutes a day, go for one minute. Any of the practices that I mentioned earlier, just aim low, do your best and increase them incrementally on a weekly basis. Um, block out time for your mental health practices and for your photography practices. Use a business model if needed if you're an entrepreneur. Accounting software and having your finances in order will keep you uh, on point, at least from a business perspective, and will mitigate psychological stress from a lack of financial structure. An ideal client profile re will remind you of who you want to work with if you're a professional. A UVP or a unique value proposition, that's one sentence that tells um, yourself and others how you're different from your competitors and the value that you bring to the market. Very important for professionals to use a UVP. And I wanna give a shout out to my assistant. Without an assistant, my mental health would have been far more of a mess, especially over the course of the pandemic. If you can afford an assistant as a professional, I highly recommend it. Um, now, this is the end of my presentation. Um, and these are some tools, some extra tools that can help you um, on your journey. I wanna say that sleep and rest and play are hugely important. Um, do not neglect them. Get seven to nine hours of sleep each night if you can. It's not possible to create at the highest level if you're not getting enough rest. And um, I'm looking forward to speaking to all of you uh, during the Q&A session following this. And I, I hope that this has been of some value to you. Thank you.